Today I want to talk about the fact that there are an infinite number of prime numbers and how I don't really like Euclid's classic proof of this. So we're going to go over Euclid's proof and then I'm going to talk about two proofs that I actually like better. I especially like the last one. So here's how Euclid's proof works. Uh, so you assume that there's a finite list of primes, p1 through pk. And then you construct a number that causes a problem. So the number that's typically discussed in most courses that introduce this idea is the number capital N, which is the product of all the primes plus one. Okay, so what's the issue with this number? Well, let's say that we picked one of these primes and that it actually divided this number capital N. Then N would have to be a product of some integer and this prime PI. Let's say A times PI. Now, the thing is, PI itself appears in the list of numbers P1 through PK. So, since PI is actually in that list, PI has to divide that product. So, PI is actually a factor of capital N minus 1. So, capital N minus 1 is some number, say B, times PI. Now that's a little bit of a problem for n and the number right before it to both be multiples of the same number. Uh, let's make explicit why that's a problem. If we actually took the first equation here and subtracted the second equation from it, we'd get that 1 is the product a minus b times the prime pi. So the number 1 would be a multiple of this prime, which doesn't make any sense. Okay, so our supposition that pi actually divided n in the first place couldn't have been the case. And we picked a random i here, so it's one of the random lists of primes that we have. So that actually means that none of these primes divide this number capital N. Okay, um, so that means capital N doesn't have any prime factors. That kind of doesn't make sense. Every positive integer has prime factors, uh, except for the positive integer one. So this is a real problem and a contradiction. So it's a cool argument. I don't have a problem with the actual argument itself. I have a problem with how natural it is. This number capital N that we came up with seems to be random. I understand where the intuition might have come from, but it doesn't feel like it builds from the ground up. And a lot of times in mathematics, especially when you're doing math research, you don't come up with these clever random ideas that come out of nowhere. Your ideas actually come from systematic and methodical thought. So we're going to look at two proofs where we do things methodically. And even though the mathematics might be a little bit more involved than what's going on in the Euclid's proof, in a sense, it's more natural because we're building up from observations that we have. So the first proof is going to deal with counting for any positive integer n, this number pi of n, which is the number of primes less than or equal to n. So for example, if n was 50, we'd be counting all the primes from 1 to 50 and how many there are. So if you want to prove that there's infinitely many primes, we can prove that this counting number goes off to infinity. Right? This is a natural thing to do. Um, you're trying to count the number of primes and prove it's infinite. So as you go on in the list of integers, you want to prove that you can keep growing the number of primes that you have. Okay, so to actually get that the limit as n approaches infinity of pi of n is infinity, we're going to do this systematically by thinking about the numbers that are actually less than or equal to n to estimate what this number pi of n actually is. Okay, so let's think about how we would make such an estimate. Maybe one thing we could do is list for a given number m greater than or equal to n the possibilities for what m could look like. So m is going to be a product of primes with powers, say p1 to the e1, p2 to the e2, all the way to pk to the ek. Okay, now the key here is we're going to be able to get upper bounds for the exponents involved. 
Now, if you want upper bounds for the exponents, it makes sense to take the logarithm of our numbers. This is not a random thing to do because we want to extract an inequality with the exponents. The only way to linearly get the exponents out is by taking logarithms. So the log of the product of these primes is the logarithm of m, and that's less than or equal to the logarithm of n because m is less than or equal to n. Now, using properties of logarithms, we can write the logarithm of this product as a sum of the logarithms, and then we can take the exponents down to be multiples, so we get that the logarithm of this entire product, which is m, is e1 log p1 dot 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 plus ek log pk. And we can use this expression to actually get an upper bound on what the exponents can be. Now if we get the upper bound for the exponents, this is good because we actually have an upper bound for the number of choices of the bases as well, because there are only pi of n number of primes less than or equal to n. So to get a bound for the exponents, notice we can get a really crude bound by looking at any one of these sum n's on the left, ei log pi, and saying it's going to be less than or equal to the sum of them, which is less than or equal to log n. So ei is going to be less than or equal to log n over log pi. All right, pi itself is a prime, so it's at least 2. And so the denominator is at least log 2. And since we're dividing, that means that log n over log pi is less than or equal to log n over log 2. And by logarithm rules, this is equal to the log base 2 of n. All right, so all of our exponents are bounded above by the logarithm base 2 of n. So this is great because that tells us that our exponents only have a certain number of choices for what they can be. And then the bases, which are the prime, these prime numbers, which all have to be less than or equal to n, only have pi of n number of choices that they could be. So we can use this in combination to get an inequality involving n. Okay, so let's look at these options. So the options for what m can be, given that it has this prime factorization, we can get an upper bound 4 by looking at the option for the bases. All of these bases, p1 through pk, are chosen from a list of primes that are less than or equal to n. So there's pi of n many of these. All right. And then the exponents, we just proved, are all less than or equal to log base 2 of n. So the exponents can be chosen as positive integers or not negative integers between 0 and log base 2 of n. All right, so now that tells us that if we look at the possible choices for the number m is bounded above by, in a really, really like crude way, the number of choices we have for all of these options for bases and exponents. So n, which is actually equal to the number of options of m, same as less than or equal to, um, is going to be less than or equal to the number of options we have for all of these exponents raised to the number of options we have for bases. Right? Every time we pick a base, we can range the exponent between all of these options. So the number of options for the exponents is log base 2 of n plus 1, because they all range from 0 to log base 2 of n. OK, and we get that choice of exponent for every choice of prime between 1 and n, and there's pi of n of those. So now we notice we have this inequality. n is less than or equal to log base 2 of n plus 1, all raised to the pi of n. That's going to let us get an lower bound for pi of n, which will allow us to achieve our goal of showing that pi of n blows up. So if we take the logarithm of both sides here, we can extract an inequality for pi of n. We got log n is less than or equal to pi of n, log base 2 of n plus 1, the log of that. So we're taking logarithms. Okay, and then that tells us then that pi of n is at least log n all over log of log base 2 of n. So this is a complicated expression that's a lower bound for pi of n, but it's a crude one, but it is one. 
Um, and if we look at the things we're taking logarithms of in the denominator or in the on the right side, n is very, very large compared to log base 2 of n plus 1. So this thing will go to infinity as n goes to infinity. And so pi of n will blow up. So the number of primes we have is actually infinite. So I recognize that this proof is complicated, but the thing I really like about it is, again, it's a systematic proof that really takes into consideration counting these things that we're considering. So now for the second proof, which is a proof that I really like, and I think illuminates Euclid's idea in a much more intuitive way than was presented by Euclid. So what it does is it considers a function for every single prime that sort of counts the multiples of the prime and keeps tally of them, not just counts them. So this function f sub p at any integer n, positive integer n, is 1 if n is a multiple of p and is 0 otherwise. So it's literally like a list of the numbers that are multiples of a given number p. Okay, so what might this look like and what can we observe about this function altogether? That's the thing we're going to investigate. So here's a list of what happens with f sub 2 of n and f sub 3 of n. So f sub 2 of n naturally goes 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. It's periodic with period 2. And f sub 3 of n is periodic with period 3. It goes 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, etc. Now, if we added these two functions, it would keep track of numbers based on whether a multiple of 3 or a multiple of 2 or both. And we notice here that this sequence is actually periodic. It goes 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 2, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 2, etc. Okay, and it kind of makes sense that this is periodic, and it turns out that the sum of any two periodic functions, from the naturals to the naturals, is going to be periodic itself. Um, so we're going to actually prove that explicitly so we know that's actually true. So our claim is if you have a func two functions, f and g, that have as their, their domain the natural numbers, their output is the natural numbers. This actually won't too, this proof actually doesn't rely too much on the, the, the codomain. Um, if you have periodic functions though, then the sum function is periodic. Okay, so let's see why. Um, so suppose we had explicit information about the periods of f and g. So suppose f had period, let's say, p sub 1, and g had period p sub 2. Uh, okay, so then in our example, we saw that multiples of 2 was periodic with period 2. Multiples of 3 were periodic with period 3. So we'll prove that f plus g, and then the, the sum had period 6. So we'll prove that f plus g has period p1 plus p2. So we'll look at what happens when we input a number plus p1 p2 to f plus g and hope that's the same as inputting the original number into f plus g. So f plus g applied to n plus p1 p2 is equal to f at n plus p1 plus p2 or p1 p2 plus g applied to n plus p1 p2. Okay now the fact that f has period p1 we can think about writing p1 p2 as a sum of p1s and then we can think about, because g has period p2, writing p1, p2 as a sum of p2s. Right? And so now, the first term is going to be f of n, because we have a bunch of copies of this p1, and f is periodic with period p1. Similarly, g applied to n plus p2 plus p2 plus p2, etc., is going to be g of n, because g has period p2. And so the sum function applied to n plus p1, p2 is actually the sum function applied to n. So this sum function does have period p1, p2. Okay, so how is this going to help us with Euclid's actual proof, or at least getting an, an intuition from where it comes from? Well, what Euclid did can be sort of interpreted in the following way. Assume, for contradiction, that we have a finite list of these primes. Um, again, the finite list is going to be numbers like p1, p2, up to pk. 
Um, and what we're going to do is look at these periodic functions and think about what happens when you add them all up. Now, why add them all up? Well, we're trying to keep track of all of the things that are multiples of our various primes. So if you construct this function capital F, which at any positive integer n is the sum of the little f functions, what it's doing is keeping track of all of the prime factors or the number of prime factors of any given positive integer n because this is our entire list of primes p1 through pk. So it makes sense to consider this function capital F if we're trying to figure out why there's a problem. Now, if we write down capital F, F at one is zero, one has no prime factors. Then we get one, one, and one, and all these prime numbers. Four only has one prime factor, six has two, and so we have a list like this. Now there's a problem with this because on the one hand, f of n is only zero when n is one because one is the only positive integer without prime factors. On the other hand, capital F has to be periodic because it's a sum of a finite number of periodic functions. If it's periodic and f of 1 is 0, that actually means that f of n has to be 0 for an infinite number of positive integers n. So this is a problem. You can't have a function that is not periodic but then is also periodic. But what I really like about this is it actually tells you a little bit more than meets the eye. So if you think about this, the period of the function capital F by the argument we had before is going to be, or at least we know it will be, periodic with period at least, or at most, p1 times p2 times all the way to pk. It could have a smaller period, but for sure, f applied to any positive integer is going to be the same as capital F applied to that integer plus p1 times p2 times p3 up to pk. So what's really happening here is since f, capital F at 1 is 0, the periodicity of capital F together with the period of these little f's will tell us that capital F at 1 plus the product of the primes is going to be 0 as well. And that is a problem because that is a positive integer greater than 1 that has no prime factors. So the reason I like this method of thinking about things as opposed to the method that Euclid came up with is even though they're somewhat equivalent, this method thinks about the structure of multiples of the given primes more methodically. And it doesn't require you to come up with the number p1 times p2 all the way times pk plus 1 on your own. It comes up naturally and it's investigating the periodicity of this capital F function right over here. So two cool proofs of the fact that there's infinitely many primes that I think are more natural than Euclid's original proof and are more akin to the type of processes that I go through when I'm investigating things, when I'm doing math research.